Hey everyone, thank you so much for listening to the WeVA podcast. I'm super excited to be welcoming Kyle Lowe, a research scientist at the Allen Institute of Artificial Intelligence. Kyle's work on applying NLP tools to the application of scientific literature mining has captured my interest honestly more than anything else in deep learning research. To give a quick preview, Kyle has worked on papers such as Cybert, a pre-trained language model for scientific text, TLDR, extreme summarization of scientific documents, factor fiction, verifying scientific claims, and a data set of information seeking questions and answers anchored in research papers, just to give you a quick sense of some of the things that Kyle has worked on in the space of scientific literature mining. Science is becoming more connected and open, which is good, but exhausting for researchers trying to keep up with it. Kyle and collaborators are developing models for tasks such as summarization, question answering, and even fact verification that facilitate this problem of keeping up with the literature and in my view will greatly impact the efficiency of science. Kyle shared his insights in the podcast on building these kinds of data sets and the lessons learned in applying cutting edge deep learning algorithms to these problems. To return to Weaviate and Vector Search a bit, I first became aware of Vector Search when researching deep learning applications for COVID-19. I saw the co-search system from Salesforce Research, which uses vector embeddings of queries to match them with vector embeddings of scientific documents. Many of the datasets Kyle has worked on are available on Hugging Face datasets and can quickly be loaded into Weaviate to explore vector search in scientific literature mining. So with that said, enough from me. I really hope you enjoy the podcast. And as a quick reminder, if you enjoy this topic, you may also like our second WeVA podcast with Charles Pierce, who similarly discusses his work on scientific literature mining. Hey, Kyle, thank you so much for doing the WeVA podcast. Hey, uh, good to be here. Thanks for inviting me. So I think a really great topic to start this off would be if you could open us up with what is scientific literature mining and just this kind of problem. Yeah, so scientific literature mining is... um, essentially like a class, uh, the goal is to take the breadth of scientific literature that scholars have difficulty keeping up to date with and reading everything that's being published um, and trying to uh, apply text mining techniques, NLP techniques um, uh, that people have been developing to try to make scientists and scholars' lives easier. Um, So this can be through extracting useful bits of information um, from these papers. Uh, it could be summarizing these papers. It could be building tools that help scientists discover um, what's the right papers or discover new papers that they wouldn't have read ordinarily. It's kind of this broad field of trying to make sense of large amounts of useful text. Yeah, I think it's one of the most interesting applications out there. And I, I personally have definitely seen this problem of trying to keep up with the information overload of trying to keep up with all the cutting edge sciences is such a daunting task. Can you tell me about your kind of progression in your career and what led you to scientific literature mining and kind of how you use your own intuition of kind of like this meta thing of being a scientist and then studying the information acquisition process of leveling up your own sort of skills as a scientist? Yeah, that's interesting. So I did kind of stumble into this field. Um, like when I joined the, the when I joined AI2, um, I joined right into this semantic scholar team and I had like no idea. I had no NLP experience. I had no text mining experience. Um, I was just interested, like a, um, I liked, I liked reading papers. Um, like uh, I had kept up kind of in my professional career, uh, still reading stats papers, machine learning papers. Um, and uh, so I guess there was always still a little bit of like attachment to like, oh, it would be nice if this was easier because um, <laughs> reading papers and keeping up with papers is hard. Um, and uh, so the when I joined and they basically pitched me this idea of like, we'd be building tools that makes this thing, makes this life easier. I was like, I could use these these things that we built. This is amazing. Um, and that's kind of how I got started in it because it's like an easy sell. Um, and uh, I guess like, yeah, in terms of like the relationship, the, the the kind of the interesting circumstance of like I'm also like a user of the tools that we're like trying to develop. Um, it definitely makes uh, there are some things that are definitely easier because you you stay motivated a lot because it's like at the worst case, um, whatever we build, there's at least I'll, I'll at least I'll want to use it, even if nobody else wants to use it. I'll, it'll at least be useful for me probably, and so, um, uh, you know, it's like. I don't have to speculate too much. Uh, and maybe there's like, you know, like 10 people out there who will also have like the similar uh, way of consuming research as I do. So there's not as much worry that I'm like hallucinating a, a, a task or a tool that nobody 
would possibly use. Um, there's always a little bit of confidence there. Um, and, uh, though there are times where it's like, am I designing systems or am I working on problems that are really specific to me? Uh, and like nobody, and like I really tailored to like how I do research or how I consume literature and like, maybe it won't generalize to other people. So there's that kind of balance. And before kind of stepping back and getting into concrete works like, you know, Cybird, Biobird, and all sorts of the things you've done that we're going to get into, I, I do want to kind of stay on this a little more and ask this kind of question about, uh, you know, you, you're describing, say, it reminds me of like developer tools where you're building something that you yourself would use and it really helps you guide the intuition. And mm -hmm. something I've always been curious about as I've been reading, and I've read quite a few of your papers now about uh, doing the scientific literature mining, and I'm curious about like, the biomedical domain compared to the deep learning domain. And I know you have a paper, uh, QASPER, Information Seeking, uh, that is annotated NLP papers compared mm -hmm. to a lot of this biomedical stuff. So I'm curious from your perspective on developing scientific literature mining, as you say, like I'm the user that helps me guide my intuition. Do you think that it's better to make progress on like, you know, kind of the <laughs> recursion again of NLP for NLP papers? or mm -hmm. this kind of NLP for uh, biomedical or say physics, chemistry, like that kind of thing. Yeah, so this is this is a, a really, um, we could talk for, for a real long time about this, because uh, I think this is also like a subject of debate on the team. Um, there's a, f whether we, a lot of projects um, that, that I work on, like, I, like my team works on, um, we try to work on techniques that are fairly general. So it's like not necessarily specific to biomedical papers or like, you know, calling things at biomedical papers is actually overly broad. It's like half of our, half of literature is like biomedical. So at, at any one sub subfield is bigger than all of NLP combined. So it's like um, uh, working on just like NLP papers or working on just like AI papers, computer science papers is only, we all have like two, 2 million of these. Um, biomedical, we have like 40 million of these papers. Um, so um, working on any one targeted field, um, the more you focus on one targeted field, um, I think you start discovering really interesting phenomena that are specific to that field. And you start, um, and things that are like really critical to resolve for there to be adoption by people in that field. Um, so like, for example, I, I just was dealing with this uh, recently. Um, even the basic task of just like extracting references from a paper, like the bibliography section, extracting references from paper and then linking them to a database of uh, known papers. Um, and that's how systems like Smart Scholar, Google Scholar, Web of Science, like all these PubMed even, like all, all a lot of these um, aggregators that report citation statistics, either they get it directly as metadata from publishers or they have to extract it and link it themselves. Um, but physics papers, a lot of them don't include titles in their bibliography entries. And so um, if you develop a tool that's just looking at biomedical papers or computer science papers, you would develop a tool that's thinking, actually title linking is like just matching based off title gives you really, really good performance. Um, and then you would completely like not build anything that's useful for <laughs> um, the physics domain. And so um, it's like these kind of like little details as, as soon as you start focusing on particular disciplines, um, you, you realize that like, this is like, it's like make or break. It's like table stakes. If you don't resolve this thing, nobody in that community will use your tool. Um, but, uh, but the problem with this is like, is this like a scalable way of doing research? Like, you know, like you could imagine like discovering a lot of more, more of these things, um, you can spend almost all of your time uh, trying to just like deal with this, deal with this and kind of doing uh, new tasks each time you try to adopt, like break into a new discipline. Uh, so there's a little bit of a juggle of like, should I focus on biomedical only? Um, if I focus on biomedical only, you know, it, or like computer science only, it's like a, it's a familiar domain. I have a lot more experience. I can build tools that work for this. Um, but if I spend too much time just focusing on this, when I, is it like, like, is it like, redoing most of it um, when I when I jump to another when I jump to another discipline or are my techniques actually fairly applicable with minor minor tweaks um, as I move into some discipline so um, 
Yeah, I guess different people on the team have like different strategies about what they feel safe committing to um, early on uh, for like, I'm just going to specialize on this discipline and hopefully it'll generalize later. And other people go like, actually, no, I'm going to start my projects trying to pick three diverse disciplines and then just making sure my tools work across all three, even if that means like a lot more upfront investment. Interesting. So, it's, so it sounds like, uh, you know, like different disciplines of science have different challenges of reproducibility and different challenges of communication. As you mentioned, the title linking for physics papers is uh, different from, say, computer science papers. And um, and maybe if we could step a little back from the idea of, say, designing very specific tasks for particular domains. But if we could kind of say that this general framework of, say, question answering or summarization is uh, mm-hmm. A uh, perfect task setup, let's say, and it's all oh, about yeah. uh, just the particulars of the domains. And so I kind of want to come into this topic of data domain, uh, domain adaptations, say maybe things like semantic drift as like uh, the meanings of words change as you go from, say, mm-hmm. uh, Wikipedia and then into uh, deep learning papers where maybe some word has some kind of different meaning. So I, I kind of really want to ask you about this origin of, I think you were one of the first authors that did uh, like BioBert, CyBert, this kind of um, ah. language where it's data domain, BERT, to communicate this idea of it's the BERT algorithm, but it's been trained on this particular data domain. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think BioBert was from Jin Hyuk Lee and others at uh, Korea University. And uh, they... Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, no problem. They they did excellent work. Um, we were working on cyber at roughly around the same time. Um, okay. And then uh, where we were kind of going across just like everything that we had in Spanish Scholar. Um, and uh, I guess like both of our groups were sort of stumbling into the, uh, this idea of like, um, what it's it's like impractical to to like train a bird from scratch, really. Um, which is like a train, retrain a bird from scratch. And each time you have a new discipline, you got to train a bird from scratch again. Um, but someone had to like kind of go through that kind of most, mostly engineering work to, 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 to prove it out. Um, I think at the time it was actually kind of, uh, there was a decent amount of pushback actually on, on like going, going down that route. Like now we know that was like, that was a good idea. Um, but at the time it was just like, why do you need that? Like our, um, what's, it's it's a lot of effort to try to kind of wrangle Google's like kind of early tensor like 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 kind of first version of Bert code. Um, <laughs> this is like pre hugging face era, um, <laughs> and uh, and it wasn't clear why people needed um, these like kind of discipline specific or domain specific Berts um, because Bert was trained on like such a wide crawl of 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 different link like language like documents, um, and uh, maybe I mean you could definitely make the case at the time I think like of like different language Berts that that they're so different that obviously you needed it. But like scientific texts, probably some scientific texts leaked in to, to the Bert training corpus. Like why why do we need this specialized thing? And so that was kind of the motivation for this. Is like are we do we believe in this idea that like actually no science is hard enough where just training on like Wikipedia and like Reddit crawls uh, is, is insufficient for picking up kind of the, the type of language that's used in scientific text. And at least people on our team and people at Korea University believed in this, uh, that it was different enough to invest in that rebuilding a BERT from, from, from scratch, or at least like spending a lot of effort adapting a BERT. Um, yeah, I think that was mostly an engineering effort. And the types of things we found was like, Surprisingly, um, there's more similarity between these disciplines than we thought. Um, and I think we know more and more nowadays that actually um, vocabulary is one of those things that like you can get away with like not worrying, not trying to retrain your vocabulary. Um, we like found BioBert actually does really well on biomedical uh, tasks, um, even with the original BERT, like kind of wiki trained vocabulary. So it's like, that's fine. Um, obviously, there's been newer bio BERTs like from MSR. There's like, I think there's like PubMed BERT, and there's like, <laughs> uh, there's like two or three of these at this point. I don't remember which. There's so many like kind of clinical BERT, I think. Um, and some of them have retrained vocabulary, some of them didn't retrain vocabulary. It's kind of unclear. It's not as like obvious uh, to us. Like, what's the impact of having like a specialized vocabulary? Um, and CyBERT's 
uh, results were also just like the vocabulary was like the performance boost was so small that like we weren't even sure if it's significant or if it was like did it matter does it warrant like like just like rebuilding up from scratch because those are really expensive um but so there's something else that's happening that's not vocabulary like it's some, something but like the performance there was substantial performance boost on these scientific tasks or these biomedical tasks from adapting regular bird to these uh to our disciplines but um, it wasn't a vocabulary. It's in like it's in something else in in the weights or something. I don't know. Um, so, yeah, I think the we've had some follow up work in in this space too with like domain adaptation. But um, I think there's still room for a lot more study on like why is scientific text different, or actually in what ways is it actually maybe just the same, and we don't have to spend uh, like a ton of time adapting these BERT models to, to handle everything, maybe just the bits that are, or that are particularly, particularly different, particularly different in scientific text. Um, so. Yeah, that's extremely interesting. And I, at the vocabulary tokenization level, I guess maybe like if you have unknown tokens, like maybe, uh, I don't know, like let's pretend like convalescent plasma therapy app or some yeah. phrase, like some gene or something like that, right? Never appears in Wikipedia. So it's not even token, it's unknown. And then you completely lose the info. And it makes a lot of sense why that would be a horrible uh, information loss from Wikipedia to the biomedical papers. And yeah, I agree with you. I think the like, it's more of that, like the latent representations that it can do that kind of reasoning, right? With that kind of thing. And uh, so one other thing I wanted to ask you about on this topic is what what your take is on you know, prompting GPT-3 to try to get it to be knowledgeable about scientific text. Do you think that? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So we have been playing with GPT-3 quite a bit. <laughs> uh, it is, it is, it is like exceptional. It is, it's actually kind of um, shockingly, like it just behaves so differently from, <laughs> from, from models that we've, we've, we've dealt with in the past. Um I think like the like one one of the most fascinating things about it was like uh I think you could prompt it for for t- particular behavior like um for a response where the response was like a list like mm-hmm. a little style response oh like it, it would say something like um uh here's three reasons why and then it actually like maintains coherency it like it actually does like bullet one list something bullet two list something and sometimes it might even like refer back to oh yeah as a chain on to like kind of bullet two something something like there's there's like i've never seen that kind of like self-referential um behavior in 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 generative models prior to gpt3 um at the time yeah and then and then um but it definitely doesn't still doesn't work on on scientific Mm. nlp tasks um We've been using it for various projects, like uh, trying to generate concepts, like descriptions for concepts, mm. uh, like technical jargon. We've been using it for summarization. We've been using it for um, actually for just for like extractive QA or even abstractive QA with, from short snippets. Um, and there's definitely, like it, it definitely doesn't work. Uh, it works reasonably well, but it doesn't work com- as well as just like kind of more accessible models, just like take BART and then fine tune it on a little bit of data and it'll outperform uh, sort of just like this pure zero shot prompt based uh, GPT-3 model. So um, it's definitely not solved everything. Uh, the really cool stuff is it seems really good at doing kind of mechanical operations. Hmm. Uh, so if you ask it explicitly to uh, synthesize like a TLDR, uh, from some input, it's pretty good at that. I think it's because TLDR generation fundamentally is very much like a pick and choose these things, and it's and you could do a lot of copying from the context that you supply, and and for the most part, those TLDR summaries are will, will look pretty good. Um, so it's actually quite good at that. Um, it's quite good at like kind of rewriting. Um, so scientific text, if you just try to consume like definitions of terms, if it's just like extracted context, um, you'll have a lot of these. For example, something, 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 or like, uh, as we mentioned before, so like these kind of dangling phrases where if you just remove these kind of phrases, these extra punctuation marks, stuff like that, it would actually look pretty good. The, the end result will actually look pretty good. And GPT-3 is pretty good at these types of mechanical operations of just like cleaning up text to, to be somewhat self-contained. Um, 
<laughs> but anything beyond that, uh, I think our team <laughs> would be hesitant to actually like put that output in front of real people. If I could dig into the details a little bit about how you explore that, do you uh, are you using GPT three as an inference API? Have you, are you exploring, say, supervised learning? And uh, maybe I don't want to ask a question that has too many things packaged into it. So maybe let me just do it one at no, a time. We're using the the, the, the public API. Uh, so as, I guess it's a fundamentally um, with like kind of the with whatever prompts um, that they that they supply with like kind of the configurations for like temperature and whatnot. And then um, it's it's the in context learning setting, uh, mm -hmm. not the fine tuned setting. So could you tell me how you adapt that for extractive question answering? Is it you give it, it's like kind of the T5 style where it, you first tell it like um, question answering, the answer is going to be in this passage, like some prompt that describes the task and then it has the context and then the question and then it generates it, right? And you have to map the generated thing. Uh, like you do like exact match with the text similarity of the generated thing with uh, the ground truth answer. Is that that's the exact right, setup? Right. Yeah, that's right. Or variations of that. We may or may not include like the 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 the, the instructions for the um for the task itself, or it could just be like three examples, five examples of like, here's the thing, here's the question, here's the context, here's the here here's the answer as a string, and then again, like you said, the exact match for evaluation or some per perturbation of like the ordering of these things. You you kind of have to mess with GPT three um, prompt form. Uh, quite a bit to get it to to work reasonably. And I think this is a great transition into our next topic where I want to talk to you about the different uh, tasks in deep learning. And I, I remember, I think you were one of the first authors that really, or and your team, of course, w that developed this uh, TLDR, abstractive summarization. And to me, it's just such a remarkably high output space that you have to have, like, Compared to classification, where you say have two labels and it's just one prediction of two labels, whereas text generation, you have, say, 50,000 potential tokens. And then you also like unroll that into like 50 or so, you generate like a long summary. Uh, what are your thoughts on that kind of difference in output space? I mean, it's a pretty big question, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so TLDRs um, was a project with uh, Isabel Cachola, who's at JHU right now as a PhD student. Um, and with uh, Arman Gohan, my coworker, um, and uh, that was an interesting one because we actually did go into the project thinking, um, "Wow, this is like an impossible task. Um, this is actually like super difficult because of this. It's so the output space is like thirty tokens, and we got to compress an entire paper, like a gist of an entire paper, into like thirty-ish tokens. Um, people can do this." Uh, people have been able to do this sensibly because you can see on like open review, which is the data set we used, um, authors are actually writing their own TLDRs for their papers for other uh, reviewers to read. So at least it's not like humans aren't stuck at going like, oh, what should I put down? At least there is some answer that the authors will arrive at. And we, but trying to replicate that with the model seems seemed like really daunting um, because of this worry that like, what, it could be anything. Like you could just put anything in, into the art, and like, how would you know? Um, but surprisingly, as we were studying more and more, uh, the teal there's the authors tended to write. Um, I'm actually more and more optimistic about this task being actually simpler than it um, than we originally thought. Um, yes, it is the output space is it is like a compress a giant document into 30 tokens yes it is generated text so you could just say anything um, but in terms of like generating if the goal is to generate some tldr that is enough information to for a user for like a reader who's like kind of scrolling through like a search page if you're on like I don't know, google scholar or something like going through a search page or going through conference proceedings or just looking at some author's profile and looking at a bunch of list of papers um, just enough information that helps people make a decision as to whether like a more informed decision as to whether they should invest like look into this paper or not um the 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 yes there are multiple right answers but you can really easily find reasonable sensible right answers from the paper itself and just kind of clean them up it's just i think this is a function of just how papers are written if you look in the introduction if you look in the conclusion 
um, even if you kind of search around like topic sentences in the um, in a within within the paper, authors tend to write in a manner that is very much like, oh, they skipped over the rest of my paper. But if I had to give them one sentence to like so that they had a takeaway, um, I'll at least put like like a main sentence in the conclusion. And so the task really becomes kind of this. Uh, even if this is kind of what what Bart is fundamentally doing, um, it be, kind of becomes: Can you find like a reasonable input context that probably contains these promising sentences that are already very TLDR like or summary like? Put those in front of a model, and then just the model just really needs to kind of shorten it, move things around to kind of get it to be short, pithy, easy to understand, self contained, um, and that type of operation is really suitable for 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 kind of these like large models that we have today. Hmm. Yeah, it's super interesting that it seemed like the large models seem to be able to uh, like decompose the task like that. And I'm I'm so curious your thoughts on this because I, it seems like you've done such an exhaustive coverage of text classification, like natural language inference, fact verification, question answering, summarization. So I'm I'm curious, and then kind of with what you're saying is, um, you could probably just classify like three salient sentences in a paper to do an extractive summary, right? And and wouldn't mm -hmm. that be much easier to like label and kind of oh. understand it than? The... Yes, yeah. So, so this actually stumbled onto a project that I'm working on uh, with um, uh, 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 Luca Soldani, who joined our team recently, um, which is like trying to identify salient sentences in papers. So there's no, we don't have any work out there right now. This is actually like pretty, like I think we are like a couple months into it. Um, uh, it is really. It is really hard uh, to find salient sentences uh, once um, if you, I guess like there's like these kind of, it's almost like there's like the step function for like, if you're, if you're, if your criteria is I want to find like one or two or three sentences max that really get at the core of a paper um, and helps a person make a decision as to what, whether to click in this paper, um, that's pretty easy. Um, Papers are written. This is kind of like what I was saying: is the papers are written, sort of with these paper, with these with these kind of summary like sentences speckled throughout. So you can look like a lot of papers just have contribution sections, where they just literally pull it out like we did this, we did this, we did this, and these are the three things that you should care about if if you don't care about anything else in this paper. Um, and so if your goal is to output like a TLDR and just want to capture that type of stuff, then the task really is find those sentences, synthesize them into something that's kind of legible. Once you start going a little bit beyond that into going, okay, well, I want something that's a little bit more like an abstract, or I want something that's a little bit more just like, uh, maybe I want like a blog, like generate a blog post about like, to summarize this paper. So something that's like cuts the paper down in, to, in length by half, but not, you know, all the way down to like a TLDR. That's when it gets extremely subjective because we recently did like a, a, a study um, where we had like 12 people on the same team uh, annotate the same paper. And this is one of our own papers. So we were all extremely familiar with it um, and just had everyone just kind of read through and select like if you had to pick like 30% of the paper to highlight that was like salient, what would you pick? And it was like aside from those few sentences or those few passages, which would uh, be prime passages for input to a TLDR model, everything else was just like hyper low agreement. Like nobody could agree that whether some of the math stuff was important. So nobody could agree like, oh, this is actually a super important detail because if you knew this field, then like this is actually like make or break for this paper. Like, and like, um, so yeah, I think that's kind of how I think of it. It's like TLDR is easy. When you start getting into like generate an abstract, maybe that's kind of easy-ish also. I think it's less easy, but it's easy-ish because there's just so much data, free data out there. And then when you start getting into like, I want something that's a little bit longer than an abstract, um, like kind of like a blog post or something like that, uh, or like a kind of like a, I don't know, there's like editorially type, type, type documents for these papers. Um, uh, that's when it gets just like, everyone's going to argue about what is actually truly salient. So <laughs> there are so many questions I want to ask to unpack <laughs> that I want to try to maybe keep, maybe keep, keep with one that I think could be quick. And then I want to ask you about these kind of data annotation uh, efforts, which I think is extremely interesting. But um, so this dense annotation where you take a, a team of 12 NLP scientists and they each 
uh, densely annotated paper, like write it, write the comments, right? Highlight and why I like this. And then do you think that the kind of idea of, say, semi-supervised label propagation where you try to uh, deploy that team for, say, 100 papers and it would probably be an expensive endeavor, but and then trying to bootstrap that dense annotation to novel papers, do you think that would work? Maybe, maybe. It's hard for me to say just because, like, um, I don't even understand the phenomena that we're annotating yet. Like when, what, what is sort of like the, the function mm. that everyone is employing when they, when they're like received with a task, which is annotate what you think is important. And somehow they map like salient or important to, I don't know, K different criteria that everyone sort of forms. And then they apply that annotation. I don't know what that is yet. I don't know what, what constitutes an important, um, I don't know how to break down what important means to people yet. So, so I'm not sure actually. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe like, um, like a, like user embeddings, some kind of model of, you know, Kyle and Connor are going through the paper and you have some kind of, uh, representation of Kyle and Connor's background knowledge to help mm -hmm. you interpret the annotation, maybe yeah. some kind of flavor of it like that. Maybe. So like if you're bringing up like kind of like user embeddings or user representations, um, you're getting into this realm of like personalization. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I guess that's kind of what I was saying is like, I don't know if this, uh, if personalization is the right place to go now. Mm -hmm. um, in general, yes, I like things to be personalized to, to, to people. It, but practically speaking, if we had to like start somewhere, we want to start with like kind of what's the most effective uh, at kind of uh, making progress on this task. And I don't know if personalization is the, is the thing. Like it could be kind of like TLDRs where um, if there is like a, shared convention in it within a community where everyone kind of looks for contribution statements everyone kind of looks for these and then then it's not about um personalizing to a person's preferences it's about understanding what the conventions are for how to read papers within this community and then just highlighting those so like the big, biggest example of this is like pico uh the pico framework within um uh medical papers like clinical cl clinical trial papers this is like a convention that people the um, you know um, clinical researchers medical researchers who read these papers have developed uh, and refined over years and they, everyone agrees that like uh, plus minus some variation of different frameworks but like that like yeah for a paper if you really want to summarize really quickly what this paper is about you got to know what the p participants are you got to know like what the population is you got to know what the innovation is intervention is you need to compare it or you need the outcome and just like if you can summarize this extract this information you can go through papers really quickly, or you can toss them in database, do some NLP to summarize and aggregate. And so understanding that convention uh, is sort of key. And I like building tools tailored to that convention is really key for this community. But, and I don't know what this, what like a PICO type thing would look like for other disciplines yet. Or if it's like, you can't, there is no PICO for, for, for understanding what people think is import, uh, salient, and therefore you should invest more in like personalization. Yeah, I, I think that is just such an such a fascinating kind of thing, the Pico analogy. And I that's kind of what brings me back to the one of the first questions I asked you about is this idea of should we study deep learning papers or say or any kind of scientific papers? Because I think like with um, deep learning experiments, we can kind of identify, say, the symbolic components of what's not. So like we could say, um, you know, it's the BERT model architecture. And uh, the learning rate scheduler is constant. Like we can construct the DAG sort of of the dependencies and the experiments and say like, here is the the normalization layers. This is what was changed. And like we could maybe, yeah, yeah like extract those kind of graphs from papers. Mm -hmm. And maybe those kind of graphs could, for one, it could quickly illustrate the paper. Like here is the paper, like it's BERT, it's this data set is constant. And then here's the thing that was changed, the normalization layers, this is mm -hmm. kind of example. And maybe that would be one way to like communicate the papers. Yeah, I, so yeah, what should we be studying? I guess like these papers uh, or like this discipline of papers versus others. I don't know. Um, I, I try not to have like, like, I guess like, like, I guess at a high level, like in kind of instinctual level. Yes, I think we should be working <laughs> on making medical research more ex like easier to digest and follow um, mm -hmm. because that seems like it's like a general good thing uh, for people um, for like, like AI papers, I was like, I don't know, maybe, maybe. Um, 
it's hard to justify that 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 uh, working on our papers is more important than working on like helping like a doctor read the, read, follow follow the latest clinical trials. Um, but mm. I think um, it depends on kind of what your goal is. The way I try mm-hmm. to do research and the way I sort of um, recommend uh, to my mentees is like try to be deliberate in your choice of which discipline to 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 a paper to study just because any project within our space is re- takes a really long time. Annotation mm-hmm. takes a long time. You got to hire experts. And so I would say do the thing that actually actually allows you to like complete, <laughs> completely finish the study on the phenomena you're interested in. So for example, um, if you want to build something useful, broadly useful, and that's it. And you're like interested in just trying to understand how can we use these NLP tools to build something that's useful. Um, pick and you have a medical collaborator, go with that. If you have, mm. if you don't have a medical collaborator, um, then I would hesitate to say that you should build something for a medical, uh, for the medical population, because mm-hmm. if the goal is to build something useful and you don't have someone from that population to work with, like, how do you ever really know? Um, you, <laughs> I would say in that case, build something for yourself because at least you are, you know, what would be useful for yourself. And that, and I think that can help people keep focused. If you're interested in studying, particular language phenomena then you should like that you think think are interesting uh for example math and like mm-hmm. symbols and stuff uh in math papers um definitely just pick the papers that have as men- much of that phenomena as possible and study that um mm-hmm. so yeah i guess it, it depends on kind of what you're trying to get out of what what's interesting and what you're trying to get out of out of out of this work um so mm-hmm. yeah i think my thesis on this is maybe like maybe too grandiose sort of it, it kind of like um i guess kind of my motivation for this is i think this is something that demis hasibus said when they ask him uh you know why ai and he kind of says well intelligence is the thing that solves all the problems so if you can solve ai you solve all the problems kind of in that sense and that mm-hmm. it's kind of like and i and i definitely think that yeah thinking that like you can just build a super AI that becomes a doctor just like, you know, without <laughs> any kind of human input. I obviously understand that you would need that kind of connection to make that uh, leap. But I guess the kind of thing about it that has really captured my interest is say open AI's codex and the ability of language models to write the code. So they so with the ability to also write the papers, digest the papers, and then also kind of like write the PyTorch code, and then you could kind of completely encapsulate them in that environment with the data sets that we're, because we're like just kind of trying to figure out how to increase like the squad benchmark, image net benchmark, right? So, so it's like completely encapsulated in that environment, which you say would be a useful generalization sort of, like the idea that it could... <laughs> write its own papers also. write its own papers um there's actually some i think uh there's some interesting work from uh kevin knight's group uh usc i think hung chi's group at uiuc who do like automatic mm-hmm. paper writing i think there's something called paper robot um, from usc mm-hmm. and then there's like hung chi's group does like automatic review writing um mm-hmm. i i would say that those I, like I mean, I'm actually a huge fan of those works. Um, I don't view them. I'm a, I'm not a fan because I like I think that should exist. That we like need systems that will write papers for us. Um, but I do think like from a research perspective, from like a, what can we get out of understanding whether these these like are like modern AI tools can and can't accomplish mm-hmm. when given these sort of like kind of absurd tasks of like, generate a paper. Um, uh, I think just studying that helps us understand mm-hmm. limitations of these tools. Mm-hmm. Um, and I th- and my takeaway from looking at those works is like, okay, what are things that these that we can kind of reliably trust mm-hmm. these these models to to get right? <clears throat> you know, autocomplete type stuff. Mm-hmm. Boi- autocomplete for boilerplate, right? Is, is the thing mm-hmm. that people love the most um, for mm-hmm. for for. LMs that write code. Um, <laughs> uh, and so what is the kind of the equivalent of that for a paper? Um, and then how can we build tools uh, around just this functionality, but allowing a human to se- seamlessly still kind of do everything else? I guess it depends on how sci-fi you want to like your like timeline. Is. <laughs> if you're like, if you want to, if you, if you don't mind your research being used, like 
like, <laughs> like kind of super, super far out, then yes, I think you should totally, you could probably work on like, let's just generate the paper end to end and not worry about the human component. Uh, for me, I'm more of like a, I'd like to see stuff being used fairly recently. And mm-hmm. so uh, for me, it's more about like, okay, what can we figure out? Can we understand these, to what extent these tools are useful now mm-hmm. or in the next few years and then partner with like kind of experts um, to build kind of these like synergistic tools. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I, agree. I think I, I did get kind of carried away with the ambition <laughs> of it <laughs> for sure. But <laughs> yeah, I obviously love the human computer interaction. I'm not like trying to put myself and us out of a job, yeah. but with the idea of like just completely automate the role of the scientists in the middle, but maybe we could um, come down, to, come down from the clouds to can we automate scientific reviewing and that question of can TLDR abstractive summarization, like what kind of tools do you, inv- I know obviously Semantic Scholar is like a platform with all sorts of things. Can you imagine like you upload your paper and then it, you know, all these tasks like Citance classification where, mm-hmm. you, you know, the model analyzes one of your citation sentences and then gives you some feedback for your, for, for the human in the loop for the sake of here's how you write a better paper. Um, that would be cool. Um, I think, I think anything in like the, the assistive writing, uh, space would be really interesting. Um, our team has, and I guess like my own interests also are definitely right now on the assistive reading. Mm-hmm. Um, just cause reading papers is really hard. Um, <laughs> and it seems like there's some reasonable promise, um, for NLP to actually help, uh, make papers. Mm-hmm make paper reading a lot easier um so and i also don't think that um working on reading and working on writing are completely like disjoint paths for research like i do want Mm -hmm. some sort of assistive writing attack when i'm like writing reviews when i'm um writing papers um when i'm writing like a tweet (laughs) about a paper that I uh, (laughs) i need i need to share um I think that like the tools needed to to enable that type of assistive writing technology at, under the hood probably has to uh, is like sort of doing some sort of like complicated reading comprehension, term extraction, definition, uh, uh, like de- definition generation, linking to to of mm-hmm. these terms to like other papers, linking of fra- claims to other papers, linking of terms to Wikipedia, like these types of. Mm -hmm. uh and operations that you would kind of you would develop if you're trying to build an assistive reading uh Mm -hmm. as well so you know you can imagine as i'm writing a review i am actually reading the paper and so whatever (laughs) helps me write this thing the the tool probably helps me read it as well Mm -hmm. and so hence right now the focus for us is like let's help people read and then maybe once that's pretty mature let's help people let's add some more stuff and start studying how, how to help people write um but yeah, I think reading is like right now just like the 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 number one thing. It's um mm-hmm. I think it should be super interesting for NLP people who are tired of working on like little short texts. You know, titles and abstracts aren't super long. Um uh full scientific documents are extremely mm-hmm. rich with like really difficult phenomena and models fall over when you try when you're trying to do anything on on these papers. Um like if you look at the performance of our best models on Casper, it's like awful. Um, and Casper is like, a, can you answer this basic question from the entire full paper? Um, mm. And the papers have figures, tables, um, things are kind of out of order because like there's like layout mm-hmm. as part of part of part of um, part of papers. Like there's like positioning involved of stuff. There's sections and subsections, so things are organized hierarchically. There's like interruptions because of footnotes, and so mm-hmm. like. Just like papers are this really rich structured document and the way we've been building these NLP models is sort of just assumes that we can just like treat the, mm-hmm. these documents as one kind of giant string uh, without mm-hmm. a structure. And so once you move, apply techniques built under this 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 line of thinking on these large papers, everything kind of just doesn't work. Um, and so that's like, I feel like that should be like extremely exciting to, to, mm-hmm. to NLP people to work on. Um, in addition to, um, this is like prime time to to apply. If you're interested in information extraction, extract information from it, uh, from extract these terms, extract relations from papers, and highlight them so that people, mm-hmm. when they're reading, they can actually see what's going on. And that's like mm-hmm. a great application if you're interested in information extraction. If you're interested in linking to databases, 
Yeah, like literally, it, it's awful for me when I don't know a term. I have to copy paste that term, open a new tab in Google <laughs> and search and find the page and then jump back to the paper. Uh, apply your entity linking thing to just like making that just like a one click thing w- without having me leave the paper. So like there's like a lot of really useful opportunity to apply NLP, mm-hmm. uh, the NLP techniques that people have been developing forever um, to papers and to, and then we, we make our own lives easier. So that's, that's mm-hmm. kind of a nice bonus. Yeah. yeah and I, well, so first I, I will, I really do want to return to the topic of mm-hmm. getting together experts to annotate, say knowledge intensive things like getting together 12 NLP scientists. And I think with Q Asper, right, right. as a team of at the University of Washington, right, and all that. And I really do want to get back to that topic, but quickly you touched on something that is just so important to we V8 and our vector search community. And as we've been partnering with uh, Gina AI, we've seen their doc array and how they're organizing this idea of you have a very complex object that you want to search through. So you have to decomp- you have to segment it into different embeddings. So as you mentioned, like you would want, say, an embedding for the abstract, an embedding for mm-hmm. you know, not even like the whole introduction, right? Because like two pages of introduction to uh, com- first, you got to put it into like 512 tokens, right? And you can like average the embeddings of, of the 512 tokens. But and then you have, say, images from the paper and then like the tables even kind of need to be formatted differently. like the math or latex equations, like like this kind of segmenting. And I'm so curious about like overall how you're segmenting. Are you right now is the approach uh, use something like Linform or like, you know, the try to get the sparse attention so that you could maybe try to put the whole thing into one transformer or is it some kind of hierarchical, uh, you know, segmentation and then propagation up? However, that might work. Honestly, nothing quite works. So, um, okay, okay, that's not true. Um, uh, I mean, um, from from the folks at, uh, from like Isabel Taggi and Armand Kohan, Matt Peters at AI2, um, with Longformer, um, we've been using Longformer mm-hmm. for a lot of our experiments. And sort of the question is, I think that you need, like, even though I think that you need some new model uh, architecture that, rep- that can represent like this, like, this like heavy amount of structure that's in these papers. Mm. Um, that's still a hypothesis. Like I could be wrong about that. <laughs> um, and, and, and it could be that models are just so powerful that today that you can just take the text, linearize it in any arbitrary way, just like take it and turn it into one giant <laughs> string and then just apply. And like maybe with like a few tricks, like add little set tokens between each section or something. Mm-hmm. And maybe that's like the, that just like, is just, better results in better performance than any sort of fancy hierarchical language models like architecture you could come up with. I don't, mm-hmm. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I think, uh, I think it's too early to tell because there's not enough tasks that actually make use of, um, there's not enough tasks and data sets on scientific papers, uh, at scale that allow people to study this problem, right? Like if you can't measure whether it's working, you, 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 you can't answer the question. Mm-hmm. Um, there's just not enough people studying the problem. So, you know, I like, I like having, I would trust kind of, I would have more stronger opinion if I had like, you know, a dozen labs just like kind of saying like, this is the right way of like, okay, yeah, it seems like they've, they've, they've mm-hmm. been studying this um, quite a bit. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't think there's just been enough experimentation um, just, just mm-hmm. to prove out different ideas. Um, like if one hierarchical model architecture doesn't, doesn't work, does that mean that like, it just doesn't work or like, mm-hmm. like or is there some, some other thing? Um, so mm-hmm. there's just like too much work that still needs to be done mm-hmm. to, for me to really have a strong opinion as to I, I have an, I have a guess that it that something special needs to happen, especially with latex mm-hmm. equations and figures and tables. Um, but there's also like a, a an inkling where just like maybe it's just about vision language models. Maybe you just like take mm-hmm. like screenshots of 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 tables mm-hmm. and figures mm-hmm. and then just like toss them into some <laughs> and, then, and then do like a Vilper type thing and then that's it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Seeing the demonstrations of Flamingo on Twitter, DeepMind's new tech image uh, captioning thing has definitely made me think that that idea of the, yeah, like screenshots of the tables, um, it's it looking might, pretty yeah, good. Yeah. It's pretty good. So it's like, mm, so, so this is one of those things like, should I invest a bunch of time trying to develop <laughs> like custom architecture that I think is tailored science documents or, mm-hmm. or is it really just about, uh, smashing these things together pre-training and then you know like that's, that's the way to go 
Yeah, and um, so I'm trying to think of if this would be too off topic, but maybe very quickly, like as we've been setting approximate nearest neighbor search, Mm -hmm. I've kind of been thinking about whether this could be the answer to very long range attention. Like if you could, uh, you know, have the the query key dot product instead turns into a approximate nearest neighbor search with an Mm -hmm. enormous set of key, uh, like the keys are vectors, right? And you're so, mm-hmm. so you match the query, like quick, I don't, I'm sorry, this is kind of distracting from another topic. No but quickly, no, 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 do you, do you think that kind of approximate nearest neighbor search into transformers could maybe be the solution to extremely large memory transformers or like extremely large attention inputs? Um, I guess like a, like a, a cheap, a cheating answer would be like, maybe. Maybe <laughs> what it means to be seen. So, so I guess um, we uh, we have some people uh, kind of joining recently, looking into like we were interested for a while into like retrieval augmented language models, mm-hmm. which I guess kind of has that idea. Right? It's, it's just like, oh, a language model. We don't need a language model like this, like enormous language models to memorize everything about 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 text. We should be able to offload some stuff like knowledge to, to mm-hmm. some other components. Uh, embed them somehow and then like guess like retrieve um, when when it's needed. Um, this seems like a really appealing way of viewing the problem of like especially in science, new things are 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 being mm-hmm. discovered, new terms are being invented, new ways of I guess like new facts about the world are constantly being being generated, and uh, it is impractical to just kind of like keep training. Well, maybe it's impractical to keep training just like language models that kind of keep keep up to date with this thing. So representing it separately and then having a language model that kind of like, I don't know, either dot products into these embeddings or 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 somehow just retrieves passages and then learns how to encode those like text patches into, into embeddings on the fly and then incorporate them into the language model. Mm-hmm. Seem promising to me. Um, I know there's like the kill benchmark, which evaluates uh uh, mo- like kind of like knowledge intensive models um, and the retrieval augmented models are sort of doing the best on the kilt benchmark, but uh, definitely, I guess still need to see more of it for science. Um, and mm-hmm. I don't, so I don't know. It's, it's like still mm-hmm. relatively new, right? Um, this, this line of work. Yeah, that's really interesting. And uh, when Malt Peach uh, from Haystack came on the VBA podcast, he mentioned that that approach of retrieval augmentation, it allows for better interpretability because you kind of see what it's using to make its prediction. It's better for updating it. And then I think uh, I think it's better for maybe removing the biases, that kind of thing, because of kind of entangled with interpretability. I think maybe there was a third thing he had mentioned that I'm uh, forgetting now. And I, I actually read a recent paper, uh, the Biomedical Enhanced... Uh, or biomedical evidence. It's called like literature augmented clinical outcome prediction. Oh, it's... I think that's from Akangsha Naik and, and Tom Hope Lucy Wong from from our team, probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's that kind of thing where you retrieve yeah. from Core nineteen, right? And it helps you do the clinical narrative yeah, completion. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that stuff is really cool. Yeah, yeah, that's so interesting. And I, so sorry. So let me come back to what we were <laughs> talking about about this idea of. Uh, taking in the whole paper as input really quickly. So it sounded like maybe your issue with it would, it would be hard to build the data sets maybe. And, and so I wanted to ask your opinion, you mentioned open review earlier as a data source, Mm -hmm. and I've seen you using techniques like this before. Uh, So, so do you think, and I, like I, you know, people review papers, they compress the paper into, you know, Strong reject. <laughs> Some explanation. Strong you reject think... or neutral, like un, 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 whatever. <laughs> yeah. So, so, do you think those data sets and from platforms like Open Review, do you think that could be a way to get that going? And yeah, yeah. So I, um, I'm like a pretty strong believer in deriving data sets from real platforms where humans are like actually using the platform to do something sensible um, Mm -hmm. as opposed to kind of like contriving a task and then hiring people to do it. Um, So open review, I I think is a great resource um, for, for real live sort of like, um, what are they? Uh, I'm blanking over like, like natural or, um, eh, it's fine, but yeah, you get the idea. It's just like, it just seems like it's a really great platform. Um, I think my only concern with it is just, it's just kind of not big enough. Uh, mm-hmm. so, you know, more success mm-hmm. to open review so we can get more data. Um, mm-hmm. 
uh, but it's limited to particular fields of, of like particular computing related fields. Um, so there's no like open review for biomedical mm-hmm. literature, clinical re- literature. Right. Um, so that's kind of that's kind of the worry. So I think it's a combination of like trying to be opportunistic, like finding mm-hmm. these like really useful data sets and also investing in techniques that help you like not have to re- build an open review for a new discipline each time just to be like, you want some way to do an adaptation to these other mm. disciplines when there is no data. Mm-hmm. And, th- and this kind of takes me to another question I wanted to ask you related to the uh, QASPER work where I think it was you, you hire uh, graduate students at the University of Washington to... Uh... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so I was wondering about like, if you had a platform that would, you know, pay people directly to do this kind of expert annotation, mm-hmm. what do you like? I guess the question I'm I'm kind of asking you is, like, with your papers, would you be willing to pay for such a review, such an annotation of your own paper, and then ah. some maybe, you know, platform that ties into, uh, it, uh, like, you also opt in to let this be used as a data set such that the language model could be trained on it to maybe supplement you not to like put you out of a job as the annotator which i guess this kind of idea was doing from the start right it's like if you're yeah a yeah, yeah. Worker, you um to... does i just uh just so i can understand the question are you suggesting that we should be paying reviewers <laughs> it's an interest i think it's an interesting thing because it the incentive system now does seem a little bizarre to me because you're kind of reviewing it for like, you know, the sake of, you know, like scientific rigor, which is great, <laughs> and I, you know, which is great. But if I feel like if you added the payment, I mean, you might get the bias towards like, I want to write a good review because they've paid me for it or something along those kind of lines. But I mean, I'm curious what you generally think of it. It's not like a startup that I'm launching no, no, no. or anything. It's <laughs> just like, what, um, what no, that's really, that's interesting. Um, I... I generally, so maybe spicy take, but like, uh, I definitely <laughs> think um, reviewers should be compensated for their work because it's a lot of work. It's a lot of expertise mm-hmm. work and the community and like publishing communities rely heavily on this. Um, we're sort of relying on volunteer effort right now. Obviously there's some like, I guess like for academia, we need to, <laughs> you know, if, if money like this destroys the sanctity of it, but I don't, I don't know, <laughs> I don't think we should pay people for their labor, so. Um, I definitely think review like reviewer work should be compensated. I just don't know if I don't I, I'm not sure about whether the author should be paying um the reviewer mm. directly or mm. if it should be coming from yeah, or like is it like through fees or something like that type of thing? I think needs to be experimented a little bit because of I guess I don't I'm not like crystal ball enough to like figure mm. out like what the how the incentives <laughs> kind of align or don't align or something with in, in the, those types of scenarios. Yeah, that's a pretty interesting detail of it. Is should the authors be, because I guess it's like, for me as a PhD student uh, publishing papers, it's like, if I can get a paper into ICLR, it would be, it would benefit my career from the rest of my life, sort of. So I, I would be willing to pay for this kind of review, right? And it's kind of like, as you put together these teams, these reviews are kind of, you know, you know, I mean, I don't know how, like, you know, obviously you communicate a lot with your teams, but the reviews are sort of the communication bottleneck, mm-hmm. at least with my PhD, in my experience with my PhD lab, the, yeah. the reviews is our kind of like interface with each other, mostly. With, so, the, <laughs> with you mean with like other researchers in the field? Yeah, like at least at Florida Atlantic University, mm-hmm. we have a little lab and we trade, we trade reviews. That's how like, that's uh-huh. how we communicate. We don't, it, so like. And I imagine a lot of other labs do interface that way. Mm-hmm. So yeah. maybe, it, you know, it connects you to the bigger, you know, market by having it be paid because then it's more like, you know, more people would probably sign up to that and offer their expertise. Because, again, it's it's like expertise. It's not like anyone could give you a thorough review of your... Uh, yeah, yeah. Retrieval augmented language model. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I um, It's interesting. It's interesting. I don't know. Um, I but I'd be interested in seeing work in this space. Um, maybe yeah. some like kind of like longitudinal studies that in, in yeah. some sort of setting that people set up. Yeah, and maybe it comes back to like code reviews too. Like the same idea, but for reviewing your code, your commits is like this idea of 
kind of like science and also code and maybe even coming yeah. way back into when I mentioned kind of codex and why I see like the code, the, the language models that write code, I think, and the language models that interpret science, I think should come together a little more. I can see that. I can see, I can see that happening for, um, I think for select things, I think for, I think I can, I can see it happening for, um, okay. So like definitely for, for fairly low level writing clarity type things, mm -hmm. um, you know, I would love it if, if something, uh, could tell me if like, I have a variable that's unassigned, which is very much like a kind of a code thing. But when I'm like typing up notation and I'm like com coming up with notation and overleaf, um, <laughs> if I just have like, like a subscript I that is literally never used, I want someone to tell me that that's the case. And that's fairly low level. It's just like checking like this thing, is it used anywhere else? Um, and then maybe I would, I would like something which is like, oh, hey, you're missing the citation mm. um, in, as you're writing. And I was like, oh yeah, mm -hmm. that'd be good. Just like prompt it so then I can figure out what to do with it. Um, so there's like mm -hmm. a lot of like little things that I have to keep in my head and I just like don't want to keep them in my head. And it would be nice if some agent could like help remind me of these things. And then mm -hmm. as it starts getting to the territory of like, <laughs> It helps me interpret my results. Like that's when I was just like, I don't know if I, I don't know if I enjoy this. Um, yeah. yeah. But I also don't think that code, like code, like the the code language model stuff, is like even at that space either. Like no, mm -hmm. nobody's like. I don't think they're creatively writing, <laughs> like just mm -hmm. like kind of the idea of the software for people. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. And, and so that's that's the the other thing you said. That's what I currently use uh, literature mining tools for is to. You know, I have an idea. Is this actually a novel idea? Hit the literature, try to find the idea. Yeah. Is that currently how you mostly use the tools? Can you tell me about like how you use Semantic Scholar and how that, you know, because again, like you have this meta thing where you're developing the tool. I do have this meta thing, yeah. It's a nice space <laughs> to be in, yeah. I do have this meta thing. I, I use, um, I actually use a combination of stuff because it's like mm -hmm. missing something is catastrophic. Um, so <laughs> I don't trust any one tool. I use Semantic Scholar, mm -hmm. Google Scholar, um, and I use, I use a lot of social signals. I think I use mm -hmm. a lot. I just use a lot of just like everyday check archive, just mm -hmm. skim the, the next batch of like 20 or so papers for that day. It's like, there, there's a lot of like, you never know when one tool is going to miss something. And I also just ask people constantly, just like, have you seen anything mm -hmm. like this? Have you seen anything like this? Um, mm -hmm. I do a lot of really manual traversal of citations. Um, mm. so, uh, it's mm. all terrible. It's all awful mm. work. Um, and we definitely need more things mm. that make it, make it, um, nicer because it really is like no one tool is, is, is kind of the thing, uh, at, at mm. the moment. Yeah. Salute to you for, uh, checking archive directly. I have to get it dumbed down through the Twitter bottleneck. <laughs> 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 but yeah. That's, that's really interesting. And maybe like a concluding question on the podcast that I ask a lot of people, and again, I, you're uniquely positioned to answer this is, what is your information diet? I mean, you, you kind of did just answer the question, but is there anything lacking from that of your kind of information diet? For my information diet? Um, wow, that's the thing. So the thing with lacking is like, <laughs> probably, but I don't know what it is. Uh, <laughs> I think that's Good the answer. problem. That's the problem yeah. with this information diet thing, right? So mm -hmm. Um, I actually don't know if there's something lacking, but there probably is. Uh, and um, my information diet today is just like I check archive um, almost every day. I actually use the Semantic Scholar feed recommendation feed, um, which is quite good. Um, it's quite. I mostly read papers that like teammates um, and like friends, people I follow will share on Twitter, share in Slack messages and stuff like that. Um, and I actually, I think like half the papers I read these days are 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 for like peer review. Mm. I like peer review duties. I actually really enjoy reviewing um, because you get to see like what people are submitting. Mm -hmm. um, you get to see like, like that's kind of like the glimpse into like what's happening right now. That's not mm. kind of in the public. And mm -hmm. um, it helps you read in a different way than if you're just kind of passively consuming what's on Twitter. Uh, they help, mm -hmm. like it keeps like kind of like the the, the critique engine sharp mm -hmm. um uh yeah i guess that's probably most of my diet but if i had to pitch an idea for somebody to go work on something mm -hmm. i would love somebody to build like a browser extension that tracks the stuff that i'm reading you know doesn't like do something weird with my data but like <laughs> tracks the stuff that i'm reading summarizes it to me and maybe recommends me like papers that 
or like avenues for accessing papers that like I should be accessing, but like I don't, I don't even know exist. I guess this is like, I don't know what I'm missing in my diet. Uh, so I want someone <laughs> to tell me that I'm not eating enough protein or something. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and maybe uh, if it's not too much of a personal yeah, question, no. could you maybe take me into like a day in your life at the Allen Institute? I'm like very curious what that entails. Yeah. So day in the life, um, I think at, for me uh, nowadays, it's like <laughs> I am in meetings with, uh, I guess like we're kind of entering this like summer uh, spring, summer, and then kind of through fall. So this half of the year, uh, it's mostly mentoring uh, interns uh, who are like kind of like current PhD students um, or undergrads who are kind of preparing for um, their PhD applications or to enter a PhD program. So it's a lot of mentoring uh, mm -hmm. people, like kind of new people who are showing up for this half of the year. Uh, we're starting on new projects, doing a lot of ideation, a lot of just like sitting in a room and just like talking about like, should we do this? Should we do this? Uh, mm -hmm. run some quick experiments, meet back again. It's like, it's stuck and try to interpret the results, try and decide like, should we invest more in this direction? Should we pivot? It's mm -hmm. a lot of these kind of, uh, really quick turnaround decisions about how, um, should, uh, how to like go about answering questions that we're interested in. Um, and then that progresses into more heavy duty development work, um, over time, where it's like every day is just like kind of writing code, running experiments, checking those experiments and then revising or fixing some bug or something and then into like writing and submission mm -hmm. which is like every day just like writing reviewing the papers chatting with people um and and continuing revising um so depending on the stage i'm in it's like <laughs> all of it is chatting with people all of it is like mm -hmm. developing or all of it is just like writing mm -hmm. super interesting well kyle thank you so much for coming on the podcast and yeah, i really much. really enjoyed this conversation i love these topics and i think scientific <laughs> literature mining and the work you're doing is just definitely my one of my favorite things to keep up with in deep learning and it seems like it's headed to such a such an exciting application being realized with deep learning cool thank you so much for inviting <laughs>